welcome to tonight's council meeting, the last one of 2019. Tonight is our Tuesday, December the 10th council meeting. And as per usual, we start off with the singing of O Canada. Do I have my O Canada singer here? All right, so if you want to step up to the microphone, I'm going to introduce you. So is the uh, little red light on, the little button? Can okay. anyone see? Councillor Campbell's going to double check. He's my lighting checker. All right. So this is Violet, right? right? Violet Van Dyke. Yes. So Violet is nine years old. She attends Mary Ward School in Niagara Falls, and she studies music with Sarah Nickel. Violet's also active in her school choir at Mary Ward and has performed for school events as a soloist. So please welcome Violet to sing our national anthem tonight for our last meeting of the year. Welcome, Violet. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all of us common, with glowing hearts we see. renditions of O Canada that we've heard here in a long time. That was fantastic. Thank you. Especially when you could drag it out because you knew you could hold your note. That's something. The only person I know that can do that is Councillor Strange. So you've, and that's a joke. So on behalf of the city, I want to say thank you. You did a terrific job. I'm sure you represent the school very, very well. Mary Ward should be proud of what you did tonight. And you got to end off the year 2019 with the last person singing O Canada. So congratulations. Great job. Thank you. Great job. Have a good Christmas. Merry Christmas. Oh, here. Yeah, well, hold on. Who's, who's, introduce. Uh, here, introduce him. Go ahead. Hold on, buddy. We're going to recognize you. Your grandfather. Go ahead, Wayne. He wants to be future mayor. Here, how about tonight? You want to start? Are you busy? Here. You can't do any worse than the current guy. <laughs> All right, well, it's nice to meet you. hope everybody has a great Christmas. Thanks for coming out tonight for this. Thank you, everyone. Sarah is responsible for Thank you. Great job. My pleasure. Excellent job. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Pardon me? Yeah. <laughs> you should say that. He doesn't like jokes. No. No. Even though he's humorous. Or is that, he has a sense of humor. All right. Moving along. Looking for uh, an adoption of the minutes from the November 12th meeting. Moved by Councillor Strange, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Uh, are there any disclosures of pecuniary interest of councillors? All right, so we have no conflicts tonight. That's great. Oh, look at that. We're at everybody's favorite part of the meeting tonight. Already? Yeah, already. Mayor's reports and announcements. Look at that, everybody. Everybody gather around the fireplace here as I tell the mayor's uh, announcements. First place, first thing we want to mention is we have a birthday up and coming on December the 26th. It's a very special birthday of Councillor Lococo. So Lococo, she's going to hit one of those magic numbers. We've been keeping your seat warm for you. So on behalf of everybody, how about a happy birthday? I'm not saying. <laughs> 
you gave me the look, and I'm not saying it. All right, we go on to obituaries. Uh, Kenneth Thomas, father of Laura Potoliva in our transportation department, passed away. Serafino Toby Pasco, father-in-law of Sandro Ilia of our building department, of Sandro Ilia of our building department. Mary Racine, the mother of Lorraine Racine in our recreation and culture department. And John Colucci, a retired Niagara Falls Fire Services uh, member. So on behalf of the city, we offer our condolences to, to the families of the deceased. Uh, so some updates. Um, just um, recently, in the last week, myself, Councillor Thompson, and our CAO, along with our uh, Fallsview BIA, met with the Niagara Regional Police. The Niagara Regional Police are offering to meet with any area businesses who are looking to increase their security. They shared the success they've had in neighboring municipalities with simple measures like security cameras and notes saying they have security cameras. And the simplest thing that they said, one of the most common um, problems and why they, people have their vehicles broken into is because they don't lock them. They said the majority of the problems, they don't lock them. So there's some simple things that can be done. The Niagara Regional Police is happy to follow up. So if you're a business, you're listening in or your business improvement area, BIA, just contact the Niagara Regional Police and they will be happy to sit down with you and help you with your security measures. Uh, also, I'd like to welcome um, Mayak. We have somebody from Mayak here today. Oh, there you are, okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, so Mayak, we've got, uh, let me see here, uh, Wahiba Ahmed, okay, did I get that all right? Not too bad. So of course, Mayak is Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee and Wahiba is part of the Mayor's Youth Advisory. So Mayak recently amended their terms of reference and are now sending a representative to our council meetings to report back to Mayak on issues pertinent to the youth. So welcome to our council meeting. Hopefully you don't fall asleep and I'm sure if you do, somebody will wake you up. Uh, this uh, past week, we were really excited to finally have the opening of Mewburn R Bridge. The Mewburn Road Bridge has been closed for about 10 years. I was joined by Councillor Thompson. It's one of the links to Niagara-on-the-Lake and also some residents of Niagara Falls in the North End. So now we've got the bridge reopened finally and uh, we can have a better connection for, for uh, everybody, our, our friends in Niagara-on-the-Lake. We recently had our Santa Claus parade. I was joined by councillors Peter Angelo, Lacoco, Dabrowski, Campbell, and Iannone. So uh, thank you to all those for coming out. It was, a, it was a good day. We had good attendance and all the kids were really excited to see the Grand Marshal, of course, Santa Claus. New Year's Eve is gonna be a big year this year, folks. Take note, it'll probably be one of the biggest ever, and we've had some big ones already, biggest in the country. Well, this year is probably gonna be the same biggest in the country. I know Serge Felicetti, our Director of Economic Development, has been working very hard. He's finally been successful in securing Brian Adams. Uh, he will be headlining the show this year. Our special guests will be Walk Off the Earth. And we have a local uh, successful um, performer. That'll be Valerie Borghese. She'll be the opening act. So this will be televised on CBC. This will be live. So this is, uh, you're hearing it first right here, Ray Pateri. And uh, it will be live here from Niagara Falls, coast to coast on CBC. And it'll be exclusive Niagara Falls from approximately 11.30 till midnight. So we have Serge uh, to thank for the hard negotiations to make sure all eyes of the country will be on Niagara Falls, especially the last half hour of the show as we bring in the new year. So uh, how about a big hand for Serge for pulling it off, finally. He's been trying to get Michael Bolton, his, who's his favorite, a lot of people don't know. Well, you know, a lot of people don't know, Serge is the head of the Niagara fan club of Michael Bolton, which is terrific. And uh, we haven't been able to nail that one yet, but the other one is- There's a lot of members. What's that? There's Serge is the only member uh, currently. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, we want to say well done for uh, bringing in uh, Brian Adams. It's going to be a huge night, just based on the excitement and interest we've heard already. It's going to be a huge night. And I just checked the weather. They're calling for a nice clear night. It should be really good. That's a joke because the weather, they don't know what it's going to do tomorrow. So, but that's okay. When you have to explain jokes, it's just not as funny. You know that, clerk? So that's it for New Year's Eve. And then uh, dedication. Now, there's one other thing I do want to mention to council. We are reached out by the former CAO of the Niagara Parks Commission, uh, Regan McCullough, 
who has now become the CAO of Sturgeon County in Alberta, which is uh, an outlying town of Edmonton. And they're feeling a little bit alienated these days. Reason being, after the election, you know, the city, the country seems to be a little bit divided. They're struggling in Alberta these days with what's happening with their economy. And he said, you know, it'd be nice if we could connect. So I just want to tell you what we did do. We took some things upon our, uh, ourselves here to help move it forward. So we've been communicating with the elected officials there, the mayor specifically of Sturgeon County, Alberta, this year, and they're celebrating the first ever winter light stroll. And they're not only kicking off the holiday season, but coming together as a community to exemplify what it means to be Canadian and communities from all over Canada are showing their support. So I'd like to take the opportunity this evening to send our best wishes to Sturgeon County as they celebrate Christmas and what it means to be Canadian. We have lit an eternal flame candle out front of City Hall this evening to honor their winter light stroll in dedication of Sturgeon County's efforts to bring communities together all across Canada. I'd like to dedicate this year's lighting of our Centennial Square Christmas tree as seen on the screen. And there is our tree, folks, if you haven't seen it lately. Last year, the Winter Festival of Lights came in and gave it a refresh and that tree is nicer than Rockefeller uh, Square, as far as I'm concerned. It is a gorgeous tree. And now for this season, we're gonna dedicate it to our friends at Sturgeon County. So I'm hoping that we can get a motion of council to officially extend friendship and warm sentiments of camaraderie and support to Sturgeon County and to dedicate this year's lighting of the Centennial Square Christmas tree at City Hall Niagara Falls to the people of Sturgeon County we're all in this together. So motion by Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councilor Strange. Is there any discussion to the motion? All those in favor? And that's unanimously approved. And I should mention too, we at the region last week did a, a video greeting of all the region, of all the 12 communities of Niagara, because in Sturgeon County, there are 13 communities that make up Edmonton. So our 12 sent a, a video greeting to Sturgeon County. That will uh, accompany this motion and the, uh, our intentions of having this year's tree dedicated to Sturgeon County. Thank you for that, Council. Council representatives, I want to thank Councilor Dabrowski for rep representing the city at the Niagara Falls Fire Department Long Service Medal Ceremony. Um, also at the Flag Raising Living Positive Niagara and the Red Scarf Project. Also to Councilor Peter Angelo representing the city at the Toys for Tots by Opry Niagara and Councillor Thompson representing the city at the opening reception of the Canadian Wrestling Trials, Niagara 2021 Canada Summer Games. And our next council meeting will be Tuesday, January the 14th. I'd like to wish everybody at home a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year as we bring in 2020. Sure. Yes, Councillor Strange. just talk to the Canadian Wrestling Championship. Yes. I, went and I, I watched them and they were unbelievable. So kudos to uh, to Marty Calder and, and the rest of the coaching staff in Brock University, which they won the title again. Wow. And we saw Erica Wee, last Olympic gold medalist, uh, win her title again. They still have a little bit of a long road, but we've got a few Brock wrestlers who went un amazing. And they're going ahead to go with the qualifiers in, in March and hopefully they can be going in, in, to Tokyo in 2020. So it was amazing. And, and the facility at Scotiabank and the help from uh, Victoria from uh, the Canada Summer Games 2021. It's going to be a great venue um, in support. There'll be, there'll be wrestling in St. Catharines at that time, but we'll be um, upcoming. We'll be hosting the Summer Games with beach volleyball. So just kudos to everyone at, uh, at uh, Scotiabank Center for putting on a great uh, wrestling championship. That's awesome. I heard it was great. All right. Thank you for that, Councillor. Um, so we move on to item 6.1, Fido Niagara presentation. Oh, Jessica, <laughs> Jessica Cohen. Hello, welcome. Jessica is going to present to council. <laughs> Just one second, Jessica. We have technical difficulties over here. Do we get things okay? <laughs> okay, great. All right. So welcome. Hi. Uh, hello, Mayor. Hello, council members and uh, everybody else. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Jessica Cohen, and I'm here to present Fido Niagara, which is a uh, nonprofit corporation, which we uh, started about two months ago to service the Niagara region. And in short, what we do is we foster people's pets who are going through tough times, specifically um, uh, uh, medical emergencies and homelessness. Uh, Fido stands for Friends Indeed Of. 
from the saying, a friend in need is a friend indeed, uh, because we are a peer-to-peer -peer fostering network. Um, so what I thought I'd do is go through a few stories of a few of the animals that we're hosting right now to tell you how we work. Um, this is Diamond. Um, she survived a house fire about two weeks ago in um, Niagara Falls, and her owner and Diamond became homeless, and they uh, walked into the library a few days ago, and the John Howard Society uh, spoke to the owner and called us and asked if we could help out. So what we did is um, uh, we took photos of the dog, posted it on our social media network. We had uh, several volunteers willing to take her. Um, but uh, I wanted to screen the volunteers, so we placed the dog at the Humane Society for the evening. Um, we called uh, Gateway Residential Services and the Salvation Army, who are now helping the, the owner to find housing. Um, and the next day, we placed the dog at a, um, uh, with a young couple with a baby and another a male dog um, in St. Catharines, and they're taking very good care of her. And we also got the Animal Assistance Society of Niagara to treat the dog for um, eye and lung irritation. Um, so our service is just for 30 days, and we emphasize that the animal owners need to be extremely proactive in finding themselves housing, because we do not extend beyond the 30 days. Um, this is uh, a St. Bernard. Uh, we received a call from uh, McMaster uh, Children's Hospital for a woman who had an emergency C-section and was unable to care for, as a single mother, unable to care for her 120-pound St. Bernard. <laughs> Um, so uh, we contacted over 50 families. Nobody could take a dog that big, so I actually called one of my buddies from uh, martial arts who was strong enough to handle him and uh, wanted to try out dog ownership. So he took the dog, um, but he forced me to bathe him first. Um, so that uh, we required that all of our families uh, work with a social worker, um, and that is to, um, it's the services by referral only, and that is to weed out people who may not genuinely be in need, and also we need to have some kind of third party validation that they're actually seeking housing. Um, this is a dog on the left. Uh, actually, the uh, mayor's office here called us for help, a woman uh, who's a senior woman. Uh, living at a motel, was about to be evicted from her motel and ref um, refused to be separated from the dog. So uh, and she didn't want her dog to be surrendered to the Humane Society. And so one of the benefits that we offer is that we're plainclothes animal lovers. So um, uh, people who might be suspicious of municipal services will trust us <coughs> with their animals. Um, so we took uh, the dog. Here he is at, uh, actually at my house uh, overnight. He had a very bad um, a flea problem. Um, and then we placed him with uh, a couple of students at Brock University who had never had a dog before and they were thrilled for the opportunity. Um, so, and then the, as soon as the woman um, got her, her uh, OW funds, she requested the dog back. That's actually the exception. Most people like us to keep watching their dog indefinitely. Um, uh, so that uh, uh, gives you kind of uh, a, a slice of what we do. Um, so I guess strategically we're supporting homelessness prevention uh, for the region. Um, our organizational chart, uh, it's myself and uh, right now a couple of friends who are volunteering as directors and uh, program managers. Um, we have uh, an active but informal partnership with the Lincoln County Humane Society. Um, Gateway Residential Services, uh, very supportive. Um, we also, we refer clients to each other. Uh, we're based out of the Spark Niagara Business Center here. We have, we're uh, like a virtual member and they've also been very helpful with business advice. And then um, Brock University and the Niagara region in, in general, like people are starting to hear about us and they're contacting us asking if they can help. Um, these are all the ag agencies that have referred uh, uh, animals to us. So pretty much everyone has heard about us and they're like, oh, you have a dog, you know, they can help. Um, <coughs> And this short demo contains everything you need to know to start using the app in minutes. What happens when the CAO does IT? Yeah. No, 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 it's okay. Um, and these are some of our partners. Uh, Global Pet, I've mentioned the Animal Assistance Society and Lincoln County Humane Society, and the Global Pet Foods has been extremely helpful in donating pretty much unlimited pet food, which is nice. Um, is ironically, it's the families that are more in need that are fostering, and, and so it's nice to be able to give them a little extra uh, pet food. And that's it. Um, if we have another minute, I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. Do we have any questions of council? Oh, yeah, Councillor uh, Dabrowski. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, great program. Contact <coughs> information. I didn't see a, a website. Oh, sure. sure. It's uh, phytoniagara.ca. Okay. Um, and I can um, exchange information with you afterwards. Perfect. Okay. 
That's Thank great. You. If there's no other questions, maybe a motion to receive the presentation. Uh, Councilor Dabrowski, second by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, so that's approved. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate you coming down, Jessica. Okay, we gotta wait for our CAO to come back. Where did he, uh... Yeah, why don't we jump ahead? Uh, what's that? <laughs> so I'm gonna switch seats with Councilor Pete. Oh, here he comes. Did you get it all fixed? Okay, so uh, moving on to item 6.2, strategic priorities presentation. Our CAO, uh, when he's done fixing the computer, he's gonna lead us in this presentation. Good job. Yeah, I'm sorry, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With Councilor Iannone here, she's asked to defer this to the next meeting. I move that we defer it. Okay, what's the, what's the direction of Council? Councilor uh, Gary? Yeah. Well, I, I just have a question. Um, I thought there was a panic to get this done because we were going to do this after the new year and then all of a sudden there's a big panic to do this. So maybe could this, before we vote on this, could the staff maybe comment on why it was so important for them to have it here? Maybe it, I'd like to hear that before I vote on a deferral. Uh, either uh, Ken or... Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, one of the reasons we wanted to have this here is because the, the discussion we had uh, a little while ago with council was that um, in order to deal with your operating and capital budget, you really should be, you know, endorsing this and getting your priorities set. So it was kind of a sequence of dealing with your strategic priorities, then dealing with your capital budget and operating budget. So that's why the sequence, the sequence is like it is. And then just to follow up on that question, then if we do pass it um, and another council has questions or wants to change something or adjust something, is it still possible to make changes and adjustments after the fact? Yeah, Mr. Cio, uh, the uh, um, well, certainly it's if if there's comments later on. I mean, uh, we would be, uh, I guess, we'd be dealing, looking at a reconsideration of of items under the procedural bylaw. If it was something substantive, if it were, if it was something, you know, minor in nature, I guess we could incorporate that. But anything substantive would have to be a reconsideration if council dealt with it tonight and approved it. I just to remind council too, we were delayed on this because we were waiting for Doug Ford's government to come down with what they were going to be doing, uh, and in the end, it was all about not n nothing happened, so we delayed for that reason. So normally we would have done this uh, probably a lot earlier in the year, um, but it's been we've been a year at this job now, so now we're at it. So it's up to councils. Uh, is there a seconder for the deferral motion? Okay. Is there another, uh, do you want to move forward then just hear the presentation, then we decide what we want to do? Yep, Councilor Thompson. Well, first of all, I, I don't have a problem with deferral, but uh, something I picked up from reading this, and first of all, to uh, Dale, uh, who has done a great job on putting this all together, uh, maybe you could change a few things here, but uh, it uh, looks like uh, apple pie and ice cream to me. Everything is there. But I looked at um, page 31, and there was a section there that says, uh, um, can we uh, make sure we keep the uh, rail line, uh, which is... Uh, um, uh, as a result between Clifton Hill and uh, Fallsview, make sure we keep that. Well, brought back a lot of memories to me. I remember working for an aerial uh, circular system on the rail line and through the Parks Commission for years. And all of a sudden, a few weeks before we were gonna finalize it, um, the Parks Commission said, no, we don't want to do it. And then we had the reaction from a lot of the stakeholders saying, well, we don't want this uh, circular thing. Uh, it's not going to go by Lundy's Lane. It's not going to help uh, Stanley and Ferry. So 
we move there onto the uh, WeGo bus system. And I remember making the motion that we do the WeGo bus system and uh, we make sure uh, that we keep the uh, rail line between uh, Clifton Hill and that we retain that for one time in the future when we can utilize that for the possibility of an, an aerial people mover system. Anyway, uh, later on when uh, I recall uh, having Al Palladini, who was the minister, when we signed the agreement for the uh, new casino, um, I was standing with him and I called Ray Spateri today. Could you find that picture back that uh, when we were there? Because I recall the words. He said, um, Mayor Thompson at the time uh, would be very happy with this announcement because we're going to put an aerial uh, people mover between the two casinos. And that was in the agreement along with the 12,000 uh, amphitheater uh, that was in the agreement. Uh, we got out of the uh, amphitheater and they give us $15 million towards the convention center which uh, appeased us, but now we got the new theater coming anyway. But uh, I still think they have an obligation to provide that people mover aerial between the two casinos, and I would like to uh, make a motion that we still pursue that and uh, with all the problems we have with uh, traffic at Stanley and Ferry, uh, Victoria and Center and all the other areas, I think this aerial uh, people mover, which they agreed to in the agreement uh, regarding the casinos, uh, should be pursued. And uh, I would like to uh, make that as a motion that we pursue that uh, through the OLG and make them stand up for what they said they were going to do. And Al Palladini uh, was uh, very verbal about that at the time when he was here uh, making the announcement. So I would so move that. Okay, so we've got a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Strange that we put into our strategic priorities, we include uh, the idea of connecting the two casino nodes with uh, an elevated people mover system. Absolutely. Okay, is there any discussion to that? They, they agreed. Yeah, is there any discussion to that? Okay, well why don't we uh, call that vote, all those in favor? Okay, so that was approved unanimously. So looks like that right now, looks like uh, there's more of a will to hear the presentation. So why don't we move forward with Mr. CAO and then we'll decide what we want to do. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I would like to because there's been a number of inputs that have gone into this document, uh, including the outstanding priorities from last term of council that we didn't quite complete. We've had a lot of feedback from council through uh, the election last year and through an educational session that we held. Several inputs from the community. Uh, over 600 responses that we received from the community on this document, including seven pop-ups that we held throughout the community. And uh, senior management and employees have had input, and uh, as well as the Youth Advisory uh, Committee. But um, in terms of our vision, uh, quite simply our vision is that we're committed to providing accountable, uh, being accountable for the provision of high quality municipal services and enhancing the quality of life for all of our residences. And the structure that we followed in putting this together is it leads with our vision, uh, gets into our values and guiding principles, and then there's a number of strategic priorities uh, and initiatives that will follow. What this breaks down to is we've come up with eight pillars 
uh, that will support the initiatives that we're talking about. And the document that Dale has put forward, Bill, if we go to the next slide, is that uh, the eight pillars which are in front of you, uh, vibrant, vibrant and diverse economy, intelligent and innovative city, diverse and affordable housing, convenient and accessible transportation, responsible and transparent financial management, strong and resilient infrastructure, engaging and accountable government, health, a healthy, safe, and livable community. Within this document, there's over 200 key initiatives that we'll be focused on over the next three years. And we've outlined over 90 performance indicators that will help measure our success. So I'd like to just, on the next slides, just give you a few, uh, a few examples. I'm not gonna try to cover all 200. We're just gonna give you some examples. So under a vibrant and diverse community, uh, we're gonna continue to enhance our position as a premier gaming destination and Councillor Thompson's motion that you just passed will help achieve that further. Uh, we want to prepare through Serge Felicetti and his group a uh, economic diversification strategy. Uh, we believe that diversification in our economy is gonna be a key so that we can not be so reliant on tourism that we can expand into other sectors uh, of the economy. We'll prepare an industrial land strategy. We're right now a bit of a victim of our own success because our own industrial park that we have is nearing uh, being filled uh, with a number of future developments coming and we've got to look to the future. And we're gonna continue with our very exciting Ryerson partnership uh, one of the piece of that partnership, as council will know, is our investment in Spark, and our Spark Investment, which is a incubator startup company that is receiving a lot of attention recently, currently has over 30 startups uh, that are uh, occupying that space on Bridge Street. Uh, it's been so successful over the last few months that we've actually had to spill over into accelerator space for a few of those companies across from City Hall. Uh, we're going to continue to develop our broadband strategy and continue to support our investment in Niagara broadband. Many members of the public may or may not know that uh, our holding company has invested in, is the provider of broadband services across the entire region of Niagara, something that we share in partnership with the, city, with the town of Niagara on the lake. Uh, when we get over into a diverse and affordable housing market, um, we are going to prepare a compre comprehensive housing strategy. I can tell you that in our operating budget that you're going to see in September, uh, Mr. Herlovich has um, placed a uh, amount of money in his budget to undertake this housing strategy for us. Um, and we're going to advocate at the regional and provincial levels for individuals and families that are experiencing homelessness in our community. <laughs> On a convenient and accessible transportation, some of the highlights here is we're gonna to continue to advocate for the uh, elevation of the Niagara District Airport to the regional level of government. This council has been on record as wanting that and our hope is to complete that during the 2020 uh, calendar year. We hope to bring full year hourly GO train as you know, the GO train service has expanded recently, and uh, we hope to bring additional service levels by advocating at the uh, provincial level. Uh, in your capital budget tonight, uh, we are advocating for a multimodal hub at the uh, Bridge Street Station, and that is a $4.4 million project, which would see a $1.65 million contribution from the city. And as I say, that's included in your capital budget tonight. We're going to look to other, uh, we're gonna to look to continue with the regionalization of our transit. And we hope to report back in the first quarter of 2020 with a new governance model for how transit is delivered across the region. We will uh, also finalize uh, the rail crossing uh, study that's underway. Uh, Matt Bilodeau's here tonight. Uh, that study is continuing. Uh, we have the second phase that we're into now, and we hope to finish that over the next, over this term of council. 
when we talk about reasonable and transparent financial management, uh, there's a report on your agenda tonight. Uh, we're going to improve our transparency for our residences, and you'll see on your agenda tonight, the start of that is that we have a report outlining all of the OLG spending that's been uh, delivered to us over the last several years. Um, that is going to be placed on our website, so all of the residents are fully informed of how the OLG money is being spent. Uh, we've also included uh, money in our, cap in our capital budget that's in front of you tonight to implement a corporate-wide uh, asset management plan and an update on all of the assets uh, that the corporation uh, administers on behalf of residents. When we look at a strong and resilient infrastructure, um, we're going to continue to make substantial investments in the infrastructure related to water, sewer, roads, and sidewalks. And I can let the public know that in the capital budget that's in front of council tonight, over $34 million this year alone related to those top priorities, which are sewer, water, roads, and sidewalk um, investment in our community. We're also partnering with several uh, other municipalities across uh, the region in terms of a climate change plan. Uh, we partnered uh, with that last year. We're gonna continue that, and we'll have more to report on council uh, during the 2020 calendar year. In terms of some of the key projects, we're looking at the ones in front of you that you can see, uh, extension of Thorlstone Road, an agri-south treatment plant, uh, reconstruction of Drummond Road and, and Cloud Roads, Bridge Street reconstruction and multimodal. I've already indicated that we've got money in the budget for that. The Whirlpool Road roundabout uh, in the capital budget tonight before council is $1.4 million to complete that. Uh, the Drummond Road project, we've already applied for funding and are just waiting for an announcement on receiving that funding. And uh, last council meeting, council did commit to providing funds partner with the region to complete the Montrose Road uh, environmental assessment that will be assisting us in doing our road network for the new Niagara South Hospital. Um, under engaging and accountable government, we are going to be entering into uh, new initiatives. We would like to look at how we can share municipal services with uh, other municipalities across the region. As council is aware, we've entered into a contract with KPMG Consulting. We're currently looking at some of these initiatives now, and we'll have more to report to council on that in early in the new year. When we uh, get into a health and safety, uh, safe community, uh, we want to continue to de uh, deliver things that uh, will be important to our residents in terms of the kind of quality of life that they have. Uh, we're going to continue to push for the new hospital. That keeps advancing monthly. Uh, our team uh, at the senior management level is in, uh, we have monthly meetings with the NHS and Ontario infrastructure people to push that project forward. It's, it's on schedule. Uh, we've just recently approved the station seven, uh, which will be built on Lundy's Lane. Uh, that is been approved by council at the last meeting and will be um, open for business in the spring of 2021. We'll continue to invest in our infrastructure programs related to playgrounds. In your capital budget tonight, there's $1.2 million to do the second round or third round, I guess, uh, for an additional 10 playground um, refurbishments this year. Under a health and safety community again, we are going to be building the cultural hub with council's approval. We have in the capital budget tonight, a placeholder for the monies to see that project advance. We will have a more detailed report coming to council in the first quarter of 2020, uh, where we'll be putting the final stamp on the approvals for that project um, moving forward uh, up in the main and ferry area. And we're gonna continue to be very vigilant on our property standards matters. 
uh, I think everybody would agree that our level of enforcement has um, increased tremendously over the last couple of years. Um, we have enhanced staff and they're doing a good job keeping on top of property standards complaints uh, that we have in our community. So Mr. Mayor, that's just a high level highlights of what's in this document. As I say, there's over 200 initiatives um, and we hope to be back on an annual basis reporting to council with those 90 indicators as to how, uh, how we are measuring our success. Those are all contained in here. We're looking for approval for tonight for the document uh, and that way we can move forward on our uh, operating and capital budgets and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you very much, Mr. CAO. Uh, Councilor Kent. Thank you, Your Worship. I was uh, somewhat disappointed that there wasn't specific reference to how we're going to deal with the homeless situation in our community okay. as part of our official plan. Okay, Mr. CAO, do you wanna? So what the plan is, and we've been in uh, <coughs> fairly uh, constant contact with our colleagues at the regional level, and uh, what our goal is is to, uh, part of that homeless, uh, part of the homelessness issue will be dealt with through the uh, housing strategy. And we would envision that as part of that strategy, there would be a component of the homelessness um, dilemma crisis uh, in that document. Uh, we've, uh, we are going to be bringing Jeff Sinclair, who is the homelessness expert at the region. Uh, Alex and I have had meetings uh, with Jeffrey as well as uh, Adrian Judley. We're gonna be tr bringing Jeffrey into uh, the fold, if you will, as a uh, of assistance to us on that project uh, to help us through that strategy. Uh, that's part of Jeffrey's role to do that, uh, and we intend to fully utilize him through that um, development of that report. Uh, as I say, we've we've included sixty thousand dollars in the draft operating budget to undertake that study, and Alex is preparing uh, to have a report probably in February that will detail the terms of reference for that study, the scope of the study, and how long that study is gonna take. So I think you know, we have to get the policy framework in place uh, before we get into really detailed specifics as to how we're gonna deal with the, the specific problems. So, so there is, uh, as you said, $60,000 uh, in a budget that we'll be seeing coming forward? Yes, and that will, deal with the policy side of it on the the housing strategy. And as I've indicated, that housing strategy will include some component of um, policies related to ho the homelessness issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was very pleased to see the strategic priorities. I know a lot of work went into it from staff, from residents, from counselors from last year. To me, there was only two gaping holes, and one of them is the homeless and the housing strategy. So when I went through it, um, I heard in the region's budget last week that there was an extra $800,000 that would be attributed to housing and homelessness. So I thought, oh great, some more money's coming. So I talked to Adrian Jugley, and I do have a statement from her because I didn't want to misquote her, but she says the region's budget ask of $800,000 additional funding for the homelessness services is intended to only support the continued provision of Niagara's current homeless system capacity. The region is anticipating with its current call for proposals that agencies will require significantly more funding to support existing services, including shelter and supportive housing. This is due to pressures associated with historic underfunding from the province, inflation, a challenging fund, fundraising environment that is impacting the agency's ability to support core services, increased experiences of damages, and both the emergency shelter system and supportive housing environment associated with the more challenging clientele in some of these programs, and the critical need for more professional staff to deliver best practice services to the residents of Niagara. It should be noted that it is recognized that homelessness funding is a provincial mandate and the region is the service manager on behalf of the province. And the region already contributes significantly to the file well beyond its obligations. Continued advocacy to the province for appropriate funding levels reflective of local need is recommended. 
So I asked Adrian, I said, well, what, I, I gave her our strategic priorities and I said, do you have any suggestions for us about where we should focus on, where we should put our money or where should we, we should put our resources? So she said, these are some things that we should consider. In preparation for the housing strategy, we should describe the actions to support council's strategic priorities associated with affordable housing. We should also identify the specific parcels of land. Regarding the incentives, we should have more detail about those and the financial amounts in the housing strategy. The housing strategy, strategy should also include specific planned investments to support both affordable and supportive housing development in Niagara Falls, inclusive of land, which I know we've talked about before, incentives, which we've talked about before, but we have to um, outline them, and expedited planning support and approvals in order to further leverage both provincial and federal funding opportunities. Additionally, strategic meetings with local providers of affordable and supportive housing in Niagara to identify the interest and local opportunity should be established early in 2020. It is important to know that the federal housing funding, particularly the co-investment fund, prioritizes proposals that have clear investments from all levels of government and recognize the financial value of municipal land incentives and expedited approvals. We need to review the wording around homelessness. A specific reference to a cold weather shelter is not helpful and ironically is considered the weakest aspect of a modern and impactful homelessness system. I would suggest that Niagara Falls should ensure that it is working in partnership with the region and local providers to ensure a modern best practice system of homelessness services include, inclusive of prevention, housing assistance, outreach, emergency shelter and supportive housing is available to Niagara Falls residents. Recognizing the clear benefits of supportive housing to reduce homelessness, the city can ensure that particular support priority is noted above to affordable housing development that includes component of supportive housing services is given. Additionally, it should ensure that actively aware of and supportive of the work of the local providers and region with the Built for Zero campaign that works with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness to specifically reduce and ultimately eliminate chronic homelessness through the application of evidence of informed practices, and these include the establish of a by name list of chronically homeless individuals, ensuring a data driven approach to service and system improvements, the provision of lower barrier housing focused shelters and outreach, coordinated access to appropriate housing, particularly housing first supportive housing models. One last one. Under the section that speaks to supporting local access with mental health and addiction services, we should start with understanding local resources and system gaps. A blanket comment about improving access and coordination <coughs> without knowing what we have and what you need will lead to a very vague and lightly unsuccessful strategy. And ensuring that local residents are aware of what is available to them and how to access it. Then a collaborative approach to understanding local gaps in service, specific priorities and identification of opportunities for the city to be supportive should be considered. <coughs> Council should ensure that the city is an active participant in the development of the regional's provincially mandated community safety and well-being plan and its implementation, which will likely touch on these same issues. So one of the things that I wrote down was where was it in our budget, so I'm happy to hear that we have 60,000 of that budget, so that's great. Um, and in, in speaking to other communities, when you have a plan, a plan is not just a couple of lines in a strategic priority document. We need to have a written out plan, so it's good that we're going to have that at housing and homelessness together. That's great. Um, the other part of it was um, some of the wording in the document to me didn't express a lot of commitment, so I think we have to have those plans in place either before we um, accept the strategic priorities document to understand exactly what they are, because the words work with, advocate, leverage, um, Im improve, th there's no plan there, and I'd like to see more plan. And the, the last part is, um, I know we've said it here in council chambers before that we don't have staff on board that is under this social lens. So I think that we need to start looking for staff, it doesn't have to be a whole person, whether it's a half a staff person, but they have to help us with these issues because the region's not taking them over. I think we have to go to the province to start looking at more help as well. But every time we have an issue, nobody knows who to call to. And, and, and you put out a call to the region, they help you as much as they can, but their arms are tied as well. And the last part on the, um, the strategic priorities is the health and safe, safe and livable communities. 
Um, I know a lot of residents are still concerned about 5G as a health aspect and as a smart city aspect, so I want to put that out there as well. But other than that, I really thank all of the staff for putting the work into it. I think it's very comprehensive. I'm just looking at that <coughs> big hole. Thank you. Thank you for that, Oscar CAO, if you could just maybe weigh in. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and all of what Adrian Judley has said to us is, I think, exactly where we should be heading. And the key message is there is that this is a provincial and regional responsibility. Uh, where we should be looking at providing guidance and assistance is in the policy area. That's the housing strategy. So <coughs> the strategic plan doesn't start with the detail. Strategic, strategic plans are giving you the uh, higher level uh, starting point. The detail, the devil be the detail, that's going to be in the housing strategy. So that's what the $60,000 is for. So even though these say advocate and work with, we will have those experts on our team to provide a detailed housing <coughs> strategy that will answer everything that you're talking about. That's the policy part. The incentive part, we're already doing. And that's something that's within our mandate, whether that's community improvement areas, whether it's waiving of development charges, uh, whether it's providing land, uh, we're doing that. And the third part was the land piece. And last meeting, council did give us approval to go ahead and start looking at additional land that we could provide as incentive for either developers or not-for-profits to start building more affordable housing in our community. So, you know, when we talk about advocating, you know, the role of this council, in my opinion, is that we should be advocating and pushing both the regional and provincial government for that funding. If, if they're not providing the money, because that's their responsibility, not ours, we shouldn't be hiring staff because we're letting them off the hook. They're the ones that should be hiring the staff. They have the experts. Adrian Judley and her staff at the region, Jeff Sinclair, uh, Kathy Cousins, they're the experts. And if they need two more Kathy Cousins or two more Jeff Sinclairs, that's where it should be happening. We should be living in the policy world, the incentive world, and perhaps providing property. But leave the experts to that level, and uh, I think even the housing strategy will say that. Because right now they've got, I think their, their budget for this kind of thing is in the millions of dollars. They just got an $800,000 more. Uh, that may be, not be enough but it should be up to those regional councillors to put up their hand and, and make that what it needs to be, <coughs> rather than us having to, to fill that gap when it's not within our sphere of responsibility. So, you know, what we're doing is things that we can do, and the housing strategy is where we need to start, and I think that will give us direction as to where we go on the whole spectrum of housing, not just the homelessness piece, because if we start looking at the whole spectrum in terms of uh, rental housing, uh, you know, more condo development, whatever that might be, it's going to fill that spectrum, which will, in its own self, help the homelessness issue. So that's where we need to be providing that policy development for people that want to come in our community and build housing. Um, but I think everything Adrian Judley fits right into what we're saying. Uh, I think this is a starting point. This document wasn't meant to be the detail. Uh, this was meant to give the opportunity to say, we're going to advocate for these things. We're going to put our money where our mouth is a little bit in terms of putting the housing strategy in place. And I think when that document comes back, um, that's the time that we really got to have a good hard look as to what our specific role is in terms of the whole housing market. Councilor? <coughs> through, through you, Mr. Chair. I hope when we put this um, housing and homelessness priorities together that we do have a social lens, not just a, a financial lens and a city lens, because since we do not have staff here, we do not have people to look at those lens. So if we do work with the region, I think it's really important that we, we utilize their services because none of us here are experienced in that. Um, the second point I wanted to make is sometimes things that are regional and provincial we say that there are other levels of government and we don't want to fund it. We, we are funding two other ones. We're funding GO and transportation and our hospital. There are other levels of government, but we're putting money into it. And I think that homelessness and housing is very important that we need to be putting money in into our residents and our citizens as well. Thank you. Um, and yet, yeah, Councilor Carrier. 
I understand what Councillor Coco is saying, but I want to give the region and the province every opportunity to come forward and do what they're supposed to be doing. They would love to have us sit back and say, we'll put the money in, I'm sure. And it's like what we're complaining about other levels of government doing to us <coughs> is taking money away that is being used for certain things that, that the, pro that the uh, region uses or the city uses. I want to do everything we can to help them. But I don't want to take it over for them, which would be what we'd be doing if we decided to come up with a, uh, a fat budget to take this over for them. I want to give them every opportunity and help them as much as we can, but I don't think that our taxpayers want to be put in a position where they fund things that the region and the province should be funding. Any other comments of council uh, on the strategic initiatives in general? So the other thing I want to remind council, this is a living document. This is not static. It isn't set in stone. It's something that council can uh, address and revisit as it sees fit. So um, I'm looking for a direction. Yes, okay. Councilor. I move the okay. acceptance. Of okay, motion by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Dabrowski. Do we have any other discussion to the, to the motion? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? With one opposed? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that, and thank you to Dale. I know you put a lot of work into it, so thank you, appreciate that. Um, Mr. Clerk, we are both at public planning. I'm going yeah. to suggest we move planning. Yeah, come back. come back, good idea, okay. All right, so um, I'm going to wait till you give me my sheet. Okay, I'll ask our clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider <coughs> a proposed amendment to the city's zoning bylaw to permit a semi-detached dwelling on the north side of Wayne Street, west of Montrose Road. Notice was given by First Class Mail in accordance with the Planning Act on Tuesday, October 15, 2019, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the zoning bylaw amendment or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal <coughs> shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets that are located outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Clerk. I'll ask our director of planning, Mr. Herlovich, to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed bylaw amendment. Excuse me, Th thank you, Worship. The uh, property in question is the uh, vacant lot on the on the screen it is a uh, uh, as an established residential area on Wayne Street um, but the land is available for uh, development and the owner wishes to proceed with that the um, the property is uh, the clerk outlined is on the north side of Wayne Street sorry the slide seems to be rather faded uh, it's immediately west of Montrose Road and just uh, or, uh, a little east of Beaver Dams Road. The surrounding uh, land uses to the north, west, and south are single detached dwellings. Uh, there's the uh, cemetery lands on the west or east side of Montrose Road, and further south, uh, fronting onto Lundy's Lane, are, are commercial developments. Oops, went backwards. The uh, <coughs> parcel in question. Uh, these are metric measurements, but it's slightly under 60 feet uh, of frontage, about 130 feet of depth. It's a large uh, lot in the, uh, this uh, subdivision, one of the Veteran Land Act uh, subdivisions in the city. The uh, property is currently vacant. They're looking to rezone the property from an R1C zone to an R2 zone. Um, the, in order to do that, they, in addition to the change of uh, zone. They're looking for a reduction in the lot frontage, which is about three centimeters per lot. Um, so it's a relatively small amount. Just want to point out while we're on this screen that the proposed uh, semi-detached dwelling uh, is well set back from the street. The R1C zoning would allow for a building to be as close as six meters frontage. This uh, building's proposed to be a little over eight meters, basically blending in um, between these dwellings. You can see the dwelling <coughs> to the east is closer to the street. The dwelling to the west is a little farther back. So it's basically uh, providing a uh, transition between those two dwellings. The side yard setback 
uh, under the R2 zone is exactly the same as the R1C zone, which is 1.2 meters, uh, which is four feet. And uh, the rear yard for this property, 7.5 meters is the uh, depth requirement in the R1C zone as it is in the R2. Uh, this proposal is actually a rear yard of about 20 meters, so uh, around about 60 feet in terms of rear <coughs> yard for this particular proposal. <coughs> Oops, what did I do, Bill? I'll let, I'll let Bill bring the, uh, the presentation back up. But again, um, can you advance that for me? A few slides. I was better with the old remote somehow or other. I seem to be here. There we are. So this is the uh, the look of the proposed building that they intend to uh, build on on the street. So semi detached um, with the attached garage for each of the units. The uh, as I said, they uh, are looking to amend the uh, the zoning from an R1C to an R2 with the front lot uh, and lot frontage regulation being modified. We did have a open house with the neighbors at the end of October. Five people did come forward. They expressed concern about introducing a semi-detached dwelling in the neighborhood, uh, entirely uh, detached dwellings. You saw the picture of the current streetscape at the opening of this presentation. Uh, they felt that the new construction uh, will necessitate the removal of a mature tree on the property. That was a concern to them. Um, the, uh, they had some concerns about uh, drainage issues. The, developer did feel that he could address the drainage uh, issues. The uh, detached dwelling, uh, or a, a detached dwelling on that property could be the same size and, and scale as the semi-detached dwelling that I showed you a minute ago. And the removal of the tree is unfortunately necessary in order to access the, the front yard of that particular unit. Um, in reviewing this application, we found the proposal does comply with the provincial place to grow plan. The, uh, it would help facilitate our 40% um, residential development in our built up areas. And the proposed development is an example of small scale intensification. The um, official plan as well um, identifies these lands as uh, residential in the official plan. It permits a net density between 20 and 40 acres. This proposal, or units per acre, hectare rather. This proposal is on the lower end at 25 units per hectare and the proposed development or building will blend with the, uh, the streetscape as I pointed out earlier. The requested zoning is an R2 zone. Um, the current zoning does not allow for a semi-detached uh, building. The uh, uh, zoning that exists in the area though, the R1C zone does permit any detached dwelling to have a second dwelling unit in there. We have seen a growing <coughs> demand for second units in buildings and houses. Um, the requested zone will result in a dwelling that is compatible in our view with the uh, existing built form. The uh, requested site specific variance of three centimeters is a relatively small amount and we don't really think will have a noticeable impact House is well set back, as I said, and the yard, side yard setbacks are exactly the same as those in the R1C zone. Um, therefore, it's our findings that the proposed development does comply with provincial policies, conforms with the city's official plan. The requested zoning for a semi detached uh, building will have the same building setback, height, lot coverage, and landscaping as required in an R1C zone, and the three centimeter reduction lot frontage is relatively small. Therefore, we're recommending to council that the zoning amendment uh, to amend the current zoning from R1C to R2 be approved. And those are the highlights <coughs> of this application. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Uh, uh, Councilor Terry. Well, your Worship, it was, it was, uh, Mr. Hurlovich was talking about that. He said he would address drainage but isn't that a necessity that he has to address the drainage in the construction of the new property? Yes, the, um, the developer is required, the responsible. builder is, is responsible for making sure, <coughs> excuse me, I think the, uh, they would grade the property as well. They talked about putting some drainage tile in 
um, and maybe the developer could speak to that when he gets a chance to address council. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions of Mr. Herlovich from council? Okay, seeing none. Members of the public are advised that fa failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to sign the sign-in sheets will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 3419 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed bylaw amendment. So anyone here other than the applicant who would like to address council on the matter before us? Yes, yeah, you can just come forward. You just want to come up to the microphone and state your name and your address and it's all yours. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you for council for allowing us to uh, be here and make our presentation. Uh, my name is Harry Thistlewaite and uh, I do live on Wayne Street and uh, we are supported here by uh, uh, a few members from Wayne Street as well as uh, some residents from Hodgson Street which connects uh, directly to our street. Um, I, I, upon looking at the summary, um, I, I have to ask staff the question, did anybody really drive through our neighborhood? Because when they said that the construction of the building is in keeping with the, uh, uh, the existing uh, uh, landscape and building, there, there's nothing in our subdivision at all that even looks anything like this home that they want to build. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the criteria is as far as uh, the comparison, uh, you know, uh, it, but it, it, there is nothing, again, I, I, I can't stress enough. Uh, I've lived in that neighborhood for approximately 20 years now, and I'm considered a newbie. Um, when we, uh, Pat and I, again, a long-term long resident on Wayne Street, uh, walked the neighborhood to talk to some of the neighbors to see how they felt about uh, this zoning change. And it was incredible, um, the number of people, the, the, the warmth, uh, just the, the, the overall color of the neighborhood. Uh, it, it struck me that uh, this, is, this is kind of the old fashioned Walton kind of neighborhood where everybody absolutely knows everybody. It's a, it's a desirable neighborhood for a few reasons. Uh, there's some big lots, um, there's space between the homes, the homes are moderately priced. It, it's, it's probably one of the best kept secrets in the city of Niagara Falls and uh, we absolutely love it. It's an older subdivision. Uh, no matter what door we knocked on, um, there was definitely com some concerns as to, as to the rezoning, not some concerns. Some of the people at the doors were uh, very, very concerned. Um, for a lot of people, um, their nests uh, will sooner or later become their nest eggs. They, have saved and saved and saved and are now retired and sooner or later they may have to lean on uh, their home and the value of their homes um, to help them carry on a, a standard of life that they've become used to. Um, first of all, I don't see a semi-detached building uh, helping that situation out in any way, shape or form. Uh, the old adage about you don't build the Taj Mahal, you build next door to it. And uh, that's definitely what these people who uh, are, are looking at this have in mind. Um, when they first came to the uh, neighborhood, uh, it was great. They bought Wilma Morse's house, and I don't know if anybody uh, is uh, familiar with, with Wilma, but she was the black historian. Uh, great lady, great neighbor, recently moved. Uh, they bought the home. They quietly moved the home over to the right, uh, which was interesting to watch. During that time, they said, uh, you know, our intentions are to build another home next door, which we thought, great, that's great to see. Uh, however, um, I think as what happens with developers, they let greed be their guide and they decide instead of a single family dwelling, they decide to put in a, a, a semi-detached. Um, well, we, we just don't want a semi-detached. It's, it's, uh, it's out of character for the neighborhood. It just simply doesn't fit. And as far as the zoning goes, it doesn't fit again. It's not part of, uh, of, of the zoning rules. We're not asking you to change any rules. We're just asking you to leave them the way they are. Let these guys go someplace else and build a semi-detached somewhere else. Or, hey, build the single family unit. If they want to build a single family unit, I'll run an extension cord across the street and help them out. Um, uh, we're, not, we're not against the development at all. Um, we have some safety concerns. It's become a very busy street. Um, with the development 
to the west of the city, a lot of people are coming down Lundy's Lane and are now trying to get around the Lundy's Lane Montrose intersection. So they're cutting through Wayne Street. So Wayne Street is becoming a busy, busy road. Now, I think you're all aware of when people are taking shortcuts, they're in a hurry. So not only are the, is, is traffic increased, but the speed of the traffic is increased, has stepped up uh, somewhat. Um, we had a situation about two years ago where two people parked opposite one another on Wayne Street. There are big boulevards, but we can't park on the boulevards, so they <coughs> parked on the streets, and these two vehicles parked opposite one another. Well, vehicles were coming from the west end. A school bus came down Wayne Street, and it couldn't fit through. So what uh, awoke me, aroused me to the situation was the horn honking. I went outside to see what was going on, and there's the school bus sitting there, unable to move because of the congestion and the traffic. The school bus literally had to back out onto Montrose Road so it could go around because the people coming from the other direction weren't moving. Um, this is not a good thing. This is, this is dangerous. And again, we're seeing more and more traffic on a daily basis uh, because of this. Um, the decision I know is in your hands. Uh, uh, and and I, I'm, I'm sure uh, it, it's a difficult one, not easy at times. But we have not only some safety issues, uh, let me just go back a step. We have some water issues. We talked about drainage here. Uh, again, my friend Pat, um, she can't cut her grass till mid-June, July because of the, uh, of, the, of the water situation. And that's not uncommon, two or three homes along Wayne Street, as well as uh, rounding the corner on Hodgson Street. So there are definitely some draining issues there. Um, it, it's been said that uh, uh, per, you know, when we were talking to these people, they said, we can't fight City Hall. And I, I said to them, you know, guys, it's not about a fight. Um, these guys are here to protect us as well. And protection comes in various colors. Uh, for, for example, law enforcement, the fire department, they, they come with a different hat. They come in blues and with a different hat. Uh, protection can come from doctors and nurses wearing scrubs. We come to city council looking for some protection. You guys are wearing uh, you know, business attire. But we know that uh, it's not all about business. It's all about looking after the citizens in the city and that you actually do care about us. And uh, a situation like this is uh, there's a bunch of uh, senior citizens who, who are really worried. They're, they're, I can't stress that enough. They are really, really worried. Uh, this subdivision is vulnerable because of the size of the lots and the moderate pricing of homes. Um, this could open up a floodgate second to none. If the lot was big enough, and didn't need any modifications or rezoning, you know what, build it. But it's not. We have to have it rezoned, and we don't need it rezoned. We don't need anything in this neighborhood rezoned. Leave it the way it is. It's a great spot. Um, again, the decision is in council hands. Um, I heard someone say once that there's a difference between doing what's right and doing the right thing. We hope that uh, the right thing here is uh, leave the zoning alone, um, somebody wants to build a semi-detached home or develop, do it someplace else, just not on Wayne Street. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Any questions of no, Mr. Thistlewaite of Council? Okay, see, seeing none. And Okay, that was great. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you. Do we have anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address Council? Is everybody here for this issue? By the way, that's here? Yes? Okay. Uh, all right, so seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Yeah, if you'd like to approach the mic, if you can state your name and your address, please. Hello, my name is Franco Faschini. I'm the son of Renato Faschini, and my father's been a builder here in uh, Niagara Falls for many, many years. And uh, this is just kind of a project and a uh, place that I'm possibly going to live myself on the one unit. And we think that it's a great opportunity to, you know, increase uh, what um, an upbuilding in Niagara Falls. Um, all the other concerns, I think, uh, we, you know, we're going to abide by all the building criteria and everything. And, you know, we're not just there to come in there and to, um, you know, take over the, 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 pro the neighborhood. Sorry. We're there to understand everybody's concerns about certain things, and we addressed in the council meeting before that. If there's any issues adjacent to the property, drainage and stuff, we're more than welcome to help out the neighbors, that kind of thing, you know, um, and that sort of thing. Yeah. 
Okay, do we have any uh, questions uh, of council for the applicant? Okay, all right. So I think we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right, the public meeting with respect to the proposed zoning bylaw amendment is now concluded. Uh, what's the will of council? Uh, Councilor Dabrowski. Uh, through you, the mayor. Um, I'm glad to see so many residents from the street came out today. It's one of the reasons I actually, Mr. Thistle, we had mentioned uh, that anyone driven out to Wing Street. I had the opportunity to, to drive out there this morning and see exactly firsthand the proposed development. And uh, the first thing that stood out to me was consistency. And nothing on that street, like Mr. Thistle, had mentioned, is, is consistent to uh, what's being proposed. Um, it's all bungalows and side splits. It's mature homes and trees and, and yards as well. And, Whenever I look at a proposed development that looks to enter a, a neighborhood years after um, houses have been built, I, I do look at the consistency and I, I just don't see it there and unfortunately the proposal um, just isn't consistent with any of the dwellings on the street. Um, it's happened before throughout the municipality across the city. I've seen it on Jupiter Boulevard where you see an empty lot sitting for 30 or 40 years and all of the neighbors question what's going to happen with that lot, what are they going to do with that lot and then uh, something gets built. It, it happened on Jupiter Boulevard where it was de a detached dwelling and it looked great and it filled, fit with uh, the other homes in the neighborhood. And then on Giovina Drive, I, I noticed uh, um, semi-detached was built in a neighborhood that was again 30 years old and it just didn't seem to fit. And I, I don't think the residents had kind of gathered together and signed a petition and, and spoke um, clearly the way you have the council and, and that was passed. And again, that just doesn't fit with, uh, with uh, the dwellings in that neighborhood. Um, I want to congratulate the residents for speaking up. And the reason I went out to Wayne Street this morning um, was because you did sign that petition and it came through our email, so kudos to you. But uh, based on the, the inconsistencies that I see within the neighborhood, we have nine out of the 10 people on the street that signed the petition. I don't blame you. If I lived on that street, I would feel the same way. Um, so to that end, uh, I'll oppose uh, what councils or what staff's recommending. Okay, thank you. So we have a, a motion to deny the application. Uh, so I've got, uh, yeah, I've got a, a Councillor Peter Angelo next. Sorry, Councillor Campbell. Yes, Councillor yeah. Peter Angelo. And I'll second that, Your Worship, and okay. I wanted to speak. I, did, I, did, I just wanted to mention, um, it was a good presentation by Mr. Thistlewaite, and uh, for a lot of years on Committee of Adjustments, uh, we had Jack Collinson, who mm -hmm. lives on Hodgson Avenue, and I know that Mr. Thistlewaite talked about the character of the neighborhood, and that's the hard part for me, actually, is the character of the neighborhood is all older, single-family, established homes. And I think that just bringing in another use really doesn't fit with the character of the neighborhood. And for that reason, I'm not going to support it. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I just want to, I don't want to repeat what's said, but I, I feel the same way. I went out there. This building will not fit. It'll destroy the character of the uh, subdivision. Okay. Any other uh, speakers? Okay, seeing none. Then we have a motion by Councillor Dabrowski, second by Councillor Peter Angel, that we deny the application. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimously approved. So thank you to the residents for coming out. And I guess the message we sent to the developers, uh, a single family bungalow would have been fine, but not a semi. So thank you very much for everyone for coming out. Okay. Can I get a motion of council to switch chairs with Councillor Peter Angelo as our budget chair, please? Who's going to carry it up there? <laughs> oh, to switch seats, sorry. Motion by Councillor Lococo, second by Councillor Campbell. All those in favor? All right, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Oh, these trees get in the way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they do. I know. All right. I know our CAO, Mr. Todd, talked earlier about the um, uh, sequence of events and the fact that we wanted to pass the strategic priorities before we started to deal with the budgets. And luckily enough, we have the capital budget that we're going to have the first blush of tonight. And I would ask our Director of Finance, Ms. Clark, to introduce it and give her presentation. So I'm going to start, and actually Eric Nichols is going to jump in at the end with a little bit of an update on some of our infrastructure. 
So um, tonight we're just going to go over the capital budget. Maybe. <laughs> Bill, can you help me, please? <laughs> yeah, that's not happening. Um, so the capital budget's available online for the public. It was actually uploaded on council's iPads on November 21st, so they've had it for about three and a half weeks. We did, um, as our CAO mentioned, we did offer a drop-in session on November 27th, so um, council was invited if they had any questions to come speak to uh, staff and get their questions addressed. Um, the capital budget right now is fully funded based on available sources, and I'm hoping to have it approved tonight. Thank you. So this slide, you've seen it already. I did it last year. I did borrow it from St. Catharines, but I really like it. So I think it's a good idea to remind everybody. So we have our operating budget, which will come to us next year. But in it, um, we have a transfer to capital, which goes over to our capital budget. And when we debenture um, for capital items, the debt payments are paid for out of the operating budget. The other consideration that ties in the capital would be our reserve funds. So. Um, anywhere where we have uh, surplus, we put away into reserve funds, kind of like a savings account. You see the little piggy bank there? And then when we need it, we can pull from it for capital budgets or operating stabilization reserves, etc. Thank you, Bill. Um, so this year, we um, put our prioritization definitions. Instead of the one, two, three we had done in the past, we just switched to the simpler high, medium, low. Um, so similar definitions as the past. High would be important, urgent, and shovel ready. Um, project has to start this year or there'd be a negative impact to taxpayers. Medium are still important projects. They might require some planning still or less important high priority projects. Um, they can start this year or next year. And then low would be projects that are on our radar but not urgent. So they've not yet been planned or designed but they are on our radar in the future. And this is a bit of our capital budgeting, pr budgeting process. So in the late fall, around September, um, I send out an email to everybody to start planning, um, submitting your list of prioritized projects for consideration for funding. Um, the CAO and myself meet with all of the departments and uh, my, account my capital accounting staff to kind of confirm our understanding of the projects, make sure um, we have an understanding of the future costs and what available funding uh, might apply. Then um, I review it with my staff, try to find funding for everything. I go back and talk to the departments and ask if they could take some things out or trade things um, that they need that aren't funded. And then we finalize it and prepare the budget documentation for council and the public. Thank you. So these, this slide is showing the pre-approved projects in 2019 requiring 2020 funding. So throughout the year, um, staff will bring reports occasionally asking for council to approve a project to start now and um, plan for the funding in the 2020 budget. So what all said and done, I go back through and I have a list of everything, uh, all the presents that are left throughout the year to fund in the capital budget, essentially. <laughs> So this list amounted to 14 million. Obviously the large one is the fire station, the $7.2 million. And in the chief's report that was discussed, that's gonna be funded 100% with development charges. Um, also the uh, Winds End subdivision, Crop Street and Pettit, that's 100% development charges as well. Next, thank you. This is just a breakdown to show you the pre-approved projects by department. Um, fire is the fire station and um, Oh, the tanker. The tanker was in there. And Municipal Works, um, the 2021 and 2022 year, that's year three and four of the four-year water meter program council approved in 2019. Next slide, thank you. This is the funding sources for pre-approved projects. So you can see development charges makes up a large chunk of this um, budget. Then transfer from water is the water meter project, as well as most of the capital special purpose reserve that's um, paying for the water meter project. So these are the new capital budget expenditure requests by department. Um, there is a listing as well on the website of all of the projects individually. Um, as usual, Municipal Works makes up the largest chunk of the budget. Um, this is mostly infrastructure projects. Um, there's a couple projects we're asking for. So where you see dollars in 21 and 22, I am asking for approval for those. So in fire services, that's their NG911 project. Um, 
it's their communications that spread over two years. So it's kind of once you start, you're not going to stop it. And it's legislated, to, it has to be finished by 2023. So we're hoping to get it done in 2021. And then in cemeteries and parks there, that is um, the uh, War Dead Veterans uh, Memorial. So the federal government is giving us $20,000 a year. We're matching $20,000 a year. So it was a four-year program. So that's just the remaining two years. Next slide, please. Those are the proposed funding sources for new requests. So something to note, um, sometimes there's a bit of a misconception that you have to approve all your budgets at the same time. It's okay to approve the capital budget right now. Um, I'm noting the transfer from operating sewer and water. They are at the levels, well, when we get to the overall budget slide, you'll see they're at the levels that are um, already in the 2019 budget. So. So long as council is not planning to decrease those level, those transfers to capitals, it should not be a problem to approve those today. And if when we get to the operating budget and the utility budget, um, we're able to increase that transfer to capital, we will propose projects at that time that, that additional monies can be spent on. Uh, something, oh, that's okay, I'll get to the next slide. So, this are, so adding the pre-approved projects and the um, New ask together, we have a, probably the biggest one in the last five years capital budget is 80, almost really $84 million. Um, again, that's two major projects. The cultural hub's in there for 13.5 million, which I'm proposing a 10.5 million debenture on. We'll get to that in a, in a future slide. And then the fire station, 7.5. So that makes up almost $20 million of that number. So a bit of an anomaly. Um, certainly the next budget can't be this high. <laughs> Um, next slide, please. This is your funding for the 83 million. So if we go down the list, you can see um, $10 million of OLG funding. This story is talking about your transfers from waters at the 5 million we had approved, sewers the 4.7, operating's 4 million. The 13 million there is the portion from the library's operating budget. Uh, capital special purpose reserves, we were able to dip into those for 4.5 million. Oh, well, well, gee, I've already said the 10 million. Development charges is huge this year. Uh, and we were able to get a lot more grants. So three million for the uh, cultural hubs come in and we haven't got the approval yet for the ICIP funding for transportation projects, but that should be coming. I believe it's on your agenda today, right? Yeah. So hopefully we're hoping to get that approval in early January. If it didn't come, um, we would be coming back to council with new funding sources for those projects. The projects cannot start without the approval. So municipal debt, so um, some reasons for taking on debt, council's well aware of this, would spread the cost of the capital project over their useful life. So oftentimes we'll debenture for a building, because the building would last for 25, 40 years. You can spread that um, debenture cost over the useful life. If we have limited internal external financing sources, debt can be a good option to spread those payments out. And then in times of low interest rates, it can, it can be beneficial. Um, in this budget, I'm asking for a debenture uh, of 10 and a half million in 2021 or 2022, depending when the project completion is for the cultural hub. And to note, um, recreation and culture is still actively pursuing uh, other funding. So if more funding came in, that could potentially reduce the amount of debenture we would need. Okay, fleet. So we're asking, uh, similar to last year, it, we would like to replace two 40-foot buses with two 60-foot buses to deal with capacity issues. Um, buses take about a year from the date of order to build them and have them delivered. So we're requesting approval to go ahead and order two buses in 2020 with the dollars to be committed from our 2021 capital budget. And then actually Eric's going to jump in and, and talk a little bit about the asset management plan and then the last slide um, will bring together all the recommendations for council. Uh, thank you Mr. Chair and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak on this. Um, Municipal Works is, takes responsibility for the care of over a billion dollars worth of assets and as you heard in the uh, earlier uh, slides, uh, this year is a monumental investment in infrastructure. Uh, so I'm going to provide some slides that um, outline um, the context for your investment and for some of the challenges ahead of us. Uh, our 2020 draft capital budget includes replacement um, and growth-related infrastructure. 
growth related infrastructure will not be addressed in my slides. Um, the concept that we've adopted as a council is that growth pays for growth and that has been done through the adoption of a development charge. Um, so all of the coming slides that I'm about to present are relatively basic and they illustrate some time frames and some um, age of pipes for our infrastructure. Um, and, it, and they're meant to be a precursor to the asset management plan and the timelines of the asset management plan, uh, which require us to have a, a comprehensive asset management plan in place by July of 2021. Um, so I'm going to run through some slides with respect to water, sewers, roads, <coughs> and our fleet. Uh, this slide illustrates the city's water main distribution network. We have a total distribution network of 478 kilometers of, of mainline pipes. This does not include the servicing, uh, the service material. Up until the 1970s, our water mains were constructed using primarily cast iron material. This type of material is highly susceptible to corrosion and is the source of many of our water main breaks. The estimated useful life of a water main is, is uh, 75 years. However, we do have some pipe in the ground that's older than 100 years old. Um, the quality of pipe installed in the wartime area is considered to be or the wartime era, excuse me, is considered to be uh, in poorer condition or poorer quality than pipe installed previously as a result of uh, availability of material. Uh, so in fact, some century old pipe may, may be performing better than uh, wartime era pipe. Additional concern with pipe of that age is uh, over time it builds up tuberculation, which is um, the, the growth of some iron deposits within the uh, interior wall of the cast iron pipe which leads to reduction in flows uh, and might be noticeable pressure reductions at the customer's tap. So in this slide, what I've illustrated is that approximately 48 kilometers of water mains are 75 years old or older. Apologize, there's a missing part of the text. Um, that is a significant challenge as we try to cope with aging infrastructure and aging water mains means we are, are faced with increased break um, risk and uh, we will be faced with significant challenges to tackle that water main replacement uh, over the coming years. Uh, we uh, benchmark the cost to replace a kilometer of water main at about $1.2 million. So the estimated backlog today for the 75 year and older water mains, 48 kilometers, is approximately $57 million. So the draft 2020 capital budget does include allocation for some water main replacement at Belfast Avenue, Baldwin Avenue, Lee, Bucator, Rapids View, and it also includes a significant investment in design for future replacement uh, at locations such as St. Such as John's Street, Willoughby Drive, Willinger Street, uh, and a few others. Next slide, please. Uh, the state of our infrastructure for our combined and sanitary sewers, we call those our wastewater sewers. Um, we have in our network 431 kilometers of pipe and approximately 70 kilometers of that pipe is 75 years old or older. <coughs> Many sewers can live on much past 75 years. Uh, however, the consequence that we, from a failed sewer uh, is very catastrophic. Therefore, uh, regular monitoring of pipe condition and rehabilitation is strongly recommended. So to that point, system-wide CCTV inspection and condition assessment of all of our sewers began this past two years, and the 2020 draft capital budget includes a $500,000 allocation to continue with this important monitoring activity. Um, the findings of the CCTV work thus far uh, have been presented to Council previously, and they've concluded that um, some major rehabilitations to our pipe are necessary. Um, to meet this need, we have addressed uh, approximately $2 million worth of rehabilitations, and that is identified in the draft 2020 capital budget uh, under the title Sanitary Network State of Good Repair Program. Uh, so 70 kilometers of our sewers that are at or exceeding our, their life expectancy um, at around $1.6 million per kilometer brings us to a backlog of backlog of over $110 million in sewer replacement needs. As a result of that fiscal challenge, uh, we're actively pursuing additional um, cured in place trenchless technologies. Um, there is an investment in this year's budget of about $2 million to pursue that. Uh, the uh, sewer lining can be completed at approximately a third the cost of replacement 
and with less uh, inconvenience to residents and the public because we're not digging up those streets. So that is a highlight for our uh, water and sewer uh, budgets. Uh, next slide, please. Our storm sewer network has an overall system length of 309 kilometers. Um, approximately 2.4 kilometers of those sewers are older than 75 years, which reflects the fact that uh, dedicated storm sewers are more of a recent feature of uh, city infrastructure, and this is common across the province. At this, at this time, there are no replacements recommended in the draft 2020 capital budget. We do recommend that those sewers that are getting on in age uh, become part of our CCTV inspection program. Uh, next slide, please. The city's road network is, uh, has a total uh, length of 463 kilometers made up of various um, arterial, collector, local, and, uh, and other types of roads. Um, the, the bars illustrated on the graph here uh, do not go by age, but we are um, presenting this uh, in terms of condition. So the, the red bar are the um, roads that have a condition index on a score of 1 to 100 at 50 or below. This represents about 6% of the city's network, or 29 kilometers. Um, Rehabilitation of those roads is beyond uh, conventional means, uh, which means you're into a full reconstruction of those types of roads. Cost to repair one kilometer of uh, failed roads is about $1.5 million. Uh, as we move over to the roads that have a pavement index of 51 to 60, we see there's 72 and a half <coughs> kilometers uh, within our network, or 16%. It is a third of the cost to rehab a road before it fails and needs to be re reconstructed. Um, so about $550,000 per kilometer to rehab those roads. Uh, the third uh, uh, yellow um, uh, pillar is the um, roads in poor conditions. So those that you may drive on that start, are starting to look like they'll need some work. Um, there's 102 kilometers within our network at 22%. The cost to rehab a road of that nature is, again, significantly less at $260,000 per kilometer, um, which would involve more or less a surface shave and pave or resurfacing. All of the other roads, which we have um, uh, more than 50% of our roads, 56%, are considered in fair to good condition, which is great news. Um, and uh, the recommendation is to continue to maintain that infrastructure so that we can keep good roads good. So with this information in mind, the natural tendency would be to attack those red roads, those reconstruct roads. Um, however, that may not be the most appropriate strategy. Um, if we apply that strategy to our, uh, to our network with limited funding, we would see this whole graph sliding to red. So the green would become yellow, the yellow would become red. So we're recommending a balanced approach where we would tackle those red reconstruction roads when their infrastructure is also failing and in need of replacement. Uh, and we would invest in maintaining our roads in good condition so that we can keep those green and good roads good and work on resurfacing and rehabbing some of our uh, more riskier arterials and collectors to bring them back up to a level where they're great condition roads. So we'll be following uh, in the future a um, risk-based approach to identifying roads for rehab. There are no shortage of roads requiring rehab, but we want to make sure that we're addressing roads where that have the highest traffic volumes, are close to bus routes, and are near tra traffic generators, and not just um, requiring upgrades as a result of paving conditions. Uh, next slide. So lastly, uh, our, our fleet, uh, Municipal Works manages a portfolio of over 300 fleet and vehicles, fleet vehicles and equipment. We don't manage transit. Uh, the average age of our, our entire fleet of 300 vehicles is 10 years old. Uh, based on age alone, the backlog in vehicles uh, requiring replacement is currently estimated at about $13 million. So that means that um, we estimate a useful life for a vehicle, say eight, 10 years, and uh, those vehicles that have already passed their expected useful life sum up to about $13 million. That is the large spike at the beginning of this graph. So since it would be impractical to replace all of those vehicles in one calendar year, uh, we are recommending an investment in our fleet to start drawing, drawing down that spike of our backlog, starting with approximately uh, $3.2 million this year, 
And the red line on that graph in front of you <coughs> illustrates a uh, uh, possible funding um, program which would reach sustainable funding levels of about two and a half million of today's dollars to maintain that fleet inventory in good condition. Uh, so the draft 2020 capital budget includes a replacement of 53 uh, vehicles and fleet equipment uh, and uh, is estimated at about $3.2 million <coughs> in your draft capital budget. Mr. Chair, those are my uh, comments on the infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Nichol. And back to Ms. Clark. Can I just a question, Yeah, <coughs> sorry, Councillor Shane. Chair, what do you do with the, the, old, the old fleet stuff that when they're done, their life is like, is it, are they auctioned off or? Yeah, and through you, Mr. Chair. So um, most of the fleet would be auctioned off when it reaches the end of its life cycle. If there's a chance to repurpose it, we'd consider that first. Um, but it's primarily being auctioned off. Looking for a new cut? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right end. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Council Campbell. Thank you. Um, just a matter of clarification. <clears throat> Going back to the overall 2020 capital budget proposed funding, I see that there is uh, about three, three, thirty-three, three thousand, thirty-three thousand dollars, thirty, three thousand five hundred um, from reserves. What, why do we not take more money out of the reserves? at this point when interest rates are low and and really fix some of the things that ha that have to be done i mean every time i drive down a road especially in a downtown area it's it's terrible just uh and another question when you're doing this the, the sewers are you making them into combined sewers when you do that at the same time at, with the road work that needs to be done. Is there that coordination in the process? Do you mean, are they separating them? Separate. Do you mean, are they separating? Like if they're yes. combined, they're separating Yes, them? but yes. Yes, but I, 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 I I'll, I'll, I'll let Mr. Nickel or Ms. Clark answer, but um, I do believe that they're being separated. Yeah, and, and thanks, Mr. Chair. So. Uh, I'll answer this, the second question, and the question with respect to reserves, I may look to our treasurer to answer. Um, yes, yeah, so, so our combined sewer separation program is one of the largest investments in the infrastructure right now. So we are, are actually leveraging regional dollars to separate those sewers. Um, we are not permitted to build new combined sewers, so our, we're actively reconstructing um, those combined sewers and I'm putting two pipes in their place, one for storm sewers, one for sanitary drainage. And uh, um, in most, if not all locations, we have combined sewers. We have very old pavements, very old roads, so they're well overdue for a road re rehabilitation as well. Thank you. Okay. And then in terms of the reserves, so, um are you asking specifically the reserve fund number? So there was reserve fund use of 335,000 and then capital special purpose reserves of 4.6 million proposed in the 2020 column. Um, we are using quite a bit of our reserves this year. Um, I can highlight on some of the uses. Uh, that would be um, a million dollars coming from our fleet replacement reserve. So council might remember in my operating budget presentation last year, um, we're trying to get uh, all of our internal rents allocated to our departments, replacement costs, and put these surplus away into the reserve, um, which would fund our fleet moving forward. So a million of the 3.2 million in fleet proposed is proposed to be funded using the fleet replacement reserve, and we hope that model continues moving forward. So that's a big part of it. Um, we have our parking reserve fund that's going to pay for half of our, proposed to pay for half of our parking strategic plan. The reserve funds is largely used from the library. The library has their own reserve funds, so um, all of their projects are funded by their own reserves. Um, I, I, in terms of the rest of the reserves that are maybe left on the table, they're not set aside for the purpose of capital. So they would be stabilization reserves for operating. They would have different purposes. Okay. Uh, does that answer the question? Yes. Well, thank you. 
Do you have a total amount for him, like roughly around five million from reserves going into the operating budget? Is that what it is? Sorry. Do you have a total amount just yeah. of reserves that are being used in in the capital budget? Is it around the five million mark? This year, yes. Around five million. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions of uh, Ms. Clark or Mr. Nickel, Councillor <coughs> Lefebvre? A few questions and a few comments. Under the grants, um, Ms. Clark said that we were applying for a lot of grants. That's $10.7 million in grants. That's absolutely wonderful that we're, we're doing that to get that money uh, put into our, our city. So I was really happy about that. Um, I had an opportunity to sit with Mr. Nickel and there's this really nice map on the wall of every single <coughs> road and they're all color coded. Uh, good, fair, very poor, poor, and it was really interesting to see what condition all of our roads are, and most of them are in really good order. There's a few that we need to work on, but it, it's good that we're keeping track of it, so I was really happy about that. Um, we, we also talked about asset management, and it's not just here in our, our municipality, but a lot of municipalities have not paid attention to our assets before, and now we have to put an asset management plan together. Even Sussex Drive, look, at it's falling down, and they haven't refurbished it or renovated it and it's going to cost a lot of money so hopefully when we look at this asset management plan we won't have some buildings like the old courthouse and the rec building falling apart because we didn't pay attention so I'm really happy about that and um, regarding the hub I know at one point we were looking at half and half half with uh, grants and half with the city paying for it. We've got about three million dollars so that's a little bit more that we have to put in and I know Ms. Clark said that they're still looking actively looking but they're also looking at some fundraising opportunities whether that be naming things, uh, purchasing seats or, or whatever so we're looking at some fundraising opportunities with that as well. And regarding the service center um, on our page 166 uh, sorry, one, uh, 203 regarding the service center. If you look over the five years, we're looking at $2.7 million to <coughs> not renovate, to what's the word I'm looking for, Mr. Nickel? Um, maintain. maintain, thank you. We're looking at $2.7 million to maintain the existing building when we know it's, it's old and we need to do something. So what I would like to put forward is that we start with a plan, uh, a solid plan about what we're doing which land are, are we building, are we renovating that one, um, because right now we don't have a plan and this budget's asking for $2.7 million to maintain over the course, course of five years. So I'd like to see a little bit stronger plan to work towards that, or what are we doing with our service center? Did yep. you have a comment on that, Ms. If Clark? I can just clarify, this budget's actually asking for $17 million, but the numbers you're saying Correct. is just the forecast, forecast. to show Correct. you what's coming up. Yes, and that's really important because I, I liked it how we did the five years to, to show what's coming up. Yes, it's only 17000 this year, but if we keep doing the same thing that we're doing, it's going to be 2.7. And rather than throwing 2.7 just to maintain a building, maybe we should look at doing something better for $2.7 million. And then um, I just just had on that point, Councillor, yes. I'll have uh, I'll have our CIO address it. I mean, I know that we've talked in the past about having a plan for replacing the service center, but I'll pass it over to Mr. Todd. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, we have been fairly active over the last couple of years. Um, when <coughs> Mr. Nickel arrived, uh, there, there had been a study uh, looking at what the needs are. We're kind of revisiting that to see what the size of land needs to be and what are the components that would be in that building. So, um, you know, during the provincial review uh, with Mr. Ford, we put it on, mm -hmm. just on hold a little bit to determine what might happen because if there potentially were amalgamations, the location of that facility may be different depending on who you amalgamated with. That's now off the table. So we're back now on, on track. Uh, you know, working to, to advance that project. Um, one of the first things, and, and I'll draw a parallel to what we did with the uh, Station 7. Uh, you know, the first thing we did was tried to plan out what the building scope might look like. We had to acquire land. Uh, we were two or three years of having that land purchased while we worked through the plans and the details and the tenders. So 
Uh, the next thing we're going to be focusing on during 2020 is advancing those plans, trying to find appropriate land. If we can find land that we need to, uh, that we feel is appropriate for where this location may be, we'd be back to council um, because as Councillor Campbell's indicating, we do have some land um, land reserves that we could look at to buy that in uh, absence of having to deal with it here. So that's specifically what that money's put away for, for land purchases as may be required as they come up for whatever reason. Uh, and we could look to those funds if we find the right place to locate uh, the service center. Thank you, Mr. CEO. Two more things. Um, I talked to Mr. Nickel about consultants. A lot of a lot of consultant fees are on here. And I know last last year, Councillor Cario talked about is a um, a trail, a trail, like why do we need consultants fees on every single trail? So I asked the same thing about sidewalks this year because the consultant fees were doing lots of sidewalks. And the answer is uh, each one needs to be very specific and we don't have those resources in house. So that's why we have to go out. But I just wanted to bring it out there because a lot of people were wondering why we're paying so much for consultants. And the last one for the external resources, we're bringing in um, over $3.4 million that's coming from the region, developers. So again, congratulations to staff for going out and finding those extra funds. Thank you very much for all of the time that staff afforded to me to go through and I had lots of tabs and questions to ask. So thank you so much. Councilor Carrier. Just a quick question. What was the estimated cost to replace the service center? I can't. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. It is identified in our development charges back on the city at $37 million. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question, um, I guess, through you to our Director of Finance, I think, in regard to the buses. So we've got a report tonight on, this, on the uh, agenda. Uh, where are we? Infrastructure program, public transit stream, and I believe that includes six buses plus refurbishing of another six. So my question is the two uh, that are in the budget, are those part of those or are those in addition to those? Those two buses are in addition to the six buses requested through the ICEP funding. So my understanding from transportation, and jump in if I'm incorrect, is that um, we're required, based on our the year of our buses, we require eight more by 2021. So the idea is to we can ask for six through ICEP funding, which is wonderful um, if we get the approval, and we still would like to get two more. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions of uh, Ms. Clark? Uh, sorry, Councilor Thompson. I would move the budget. Okay, move the three recommendations that are yeah. in the report. So moved by Councilor Thompson, yeah. seconded by Councilor Dabrowski. To okay, work. thank you. Any other questions or comments before I call the vote? If not, all those in favor? Opposed? The motion's carried, thank you. Um, <laughs> Under reports, the uh, the next report is F2019-45, uh, dealing with the history of the OLG spending and commitments under the new agreement. And uh, once again, I want to give, uh, uh, I guess, a shout out to Ms. Clark for uh, detailing every single one and putting it all in a nice format so that the public can see uh, what the money was spent on every single year. Um, it's uh, it's great to be able to say that you know the bulk of the money went towards infrastructure and you know that's the way that uh, we're using the money which is a very responsible manner so um, thanks to Ms. Clark for putting that together and I understand it's going to be up on the city's website so that anyone can access it if they want does anyone have any questions at all uh, in regards to the report? the report okay I have a motion by Councillor Thompson seconded by Councillor Dabrowski <coughs> to move the report I'll call the vote all those in favor Opposed, the motion's carried. I'll uh, pass the meeting back over to the mayor now. Folks, uh, we're now moving on the agenda to 8.2, St. John's Marsh Drain. We have two recommendations. Uh, one, the City Council adopt the amended engineer's report 
And secondly, the council give a third reading to the bylaw. I, I, would, uh, I, I just want to speak. I mean, I, I know that we have Nicolia from staff here in case there's any questions. And as well, I wanted to see if there's anyone from the public here. If not, I'd be happy to move the recommendations. Okay. Do we have anyone here uh, from the public on the St. John's Marsh uh, issue? Okay, seeing we don't, okay. Okay, moved by Councilor Pianangelo, uh, Councilor uh, Lococo. I would support the recommendation. I know that there was a resident that is speaking with Mr. Golia and Mr. Nickel, and they're going to work around a few uh, in-house things that they can do outside of this um, because it did directly affect the drainage on their properties, mm -hmm. but I'm happy to support it. Okay, that's great. If there's no uh, further comment, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Thank you for that. Item 8.3, Transit Capital Projects Investing in Canada Both Infrastructure Program. Motion by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Strange, that we um, approve the, the recommendation, <coughs> and there are two as well. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved, and hopefully we'll be successful with that money. Conse Consent, Consent agenda? Consent agenda, Worship. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Pierangelo, to move the consent agenda. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. We move our way down to which item, Mr. Clerk? Uh, one consent. Give me one second, folks. Here we go. Communications. Okay, first up, downtown BIA uh, requesting access to CIP fund request. There's a recommendation. Um, let me get it up here. So there's a request by Ron Charbonneau, the chair, that access CIP funding for improvements made to downtown Niagara Falls this year. It includes invoices for repairs to the sound system on Queen Street and the purchase of LED light sets. Yes? Okay. Motion by Councillor Lococo, seconded by Councillor uh, Dabrowski. If there's no discu further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and approved. I apologize about these Christmas trees tonight. I have a little hard time seeing everybody. Okay, item 10.2, Niagara Falls Community Cats, Pam Brown, president of Niagara Falls Community Cats, requesting funding to help the cost of spaying and neutering. There's a recommendation that this be referred to the Humane Society, SPCA, as they are our contractor. Councillor Thompson. Well, I think it's a waste of time to refer because the Humane Society uh, doesn't do that and doesn't look after these are all volunteer people, uh, but I would make a motion. We refer it, and we also refer the request to the uh, operating budget. Okay, so the first part, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first part. Yeah, we refer it to the uh, Humane Society. Okay. But uh, I know we've been through this before. They don't do any of the work, nuding. Uh, with the uh, uh, animals, cats. Okay, so um, there's a motion by Councillor Thompson that we do, in fact, re refer this to the Humane Society SPCA and as well um, put it along with the operating budget to be dealt with at that time. Do we have a seconder to that motion? Uh, Councillor uh, Cario? Okay, any discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll take the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Item 10.3, the YMCA, is requesting some bus tickets to keep at the McBain Center, limited number for people, homeless people, that'll need it on an emergency basis. Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move to accept the report to um, deny it. Um, the reason being is we are giving out numerous bus tickets in different forms and we're able to track it. We're not able to track it through this this way. So I, I would accept the report. Okay, so motion by Councillor Lococo to deny it. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Campbell, <clears throat> is there any discussion to this? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and it's approved that it's denied. Item 10.4, Council's delegation of authority regarding muzzling of dogs. Okay, so there's a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo uh, seconded by Councillor Campbell, that Council pass the delegation authority bylaw on tonight's agenda, allowing members of the city's property standards committee to hold the required hearing with respect to muzzling of dogs. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Council, yes, you're in favor. Okay, thank you. Item 10.5 is a letter from Minister Clark, 
uh, to the city, uh, to heads of council, uh, just recommendations. It's just okay. Um, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we receive and file the letter. All those in favor? Okay, it's approved. Item 10.6, Township of Romera. Uh, there's a letter that they've sent to us with uh, resolutions. Recommendation is that we receive and to file it. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we receive and file. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. There's a motion, 10.7, sorry, the Town of Waynefleet regarding insurance and liability costs. They have a re resolution in there in regard to the Attorney General of Ontario regarding insurance and liability. There's a recommendation that we receive and file. Yeah, receive and file, Your Worship, 10, 7, 10, 8, 10, 9. Okay, so item, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Dabrowski, that we approve item 10.7, 10.8, 10.9. So item 10.7 is the insurance and liability resolution from down of Waynefleet. Item 10.8 is various correspondence from the region. And item 10.9 is the Niagara Regional Housing third quarter report to the board. Uh, we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Yeah. We did 10.7, 10.8, 10.9. what the uh, last one for the uh, tourism at the region what they're they're just putting 300,000 out for uh, sports uh, yeah so they're they're because just like they got the Canada summer games which is going to be a good boon to the region they realize sports tourism is something that we can do in the region with all these new facilities okay, they're building but they're not getting into tourism that's not part of this no okay. I think they understand that it's being done well in Niagara Falls and Niagara on the lake and, well I don't I, you got regional you got the hotel association you got the BIAs and <laughs> there's enough uh, don't want to create another situation at the region. I agree. Okay, so we, did we, we voted, right? Did we yeah. vote? Yes, we did, thank you. Item 10, 10, 10 flag raising. A motion by Councillor uh, Dabrowski, second by Councillor Strange, that the City of Niagara Falls, for the month of January 2020, have a date to raise the flag for crime stoppers in Niagara. We'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. Now, resolution, Mr. Clerk, we've got a resolution here. Uh, well, can you tell Council about the resolution before we vote? Uh, this is pertaining to a planning matter, so I perhaps defer to the uh, Director of Planning. Mr. Erlovich? Uh, yes, uh, to your worship, the, this was a report that was on the agenda earlier to uh, waive the two-year uh, waiting period in order for the applicant to apply for a minor variance. Yeah, so moved. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Dabrowski. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. And then we, no, we're not on the bylaw. We've got, no, do we do with these ones separately, Mr. Clerk? Exactly. Okay, motion by second. Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Campbell, that we give a third reading to the bylaw under the Drainage Act. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. So we are now into the bylaws, are we not, Mr. Clerk? Yes, okay. Move the first, second, and third reading, Your Worship, of the bylaws. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Campbell, that the bylaws be given a first, second, and third reading. Uh, did you, before we call the vote, did you want to speak to it? Yeah, before we call the vote, Your Worship, I just want to show myself as opposed to bylaw 2019-131. 131. 130. 131, as I voted against the rezoning. That was for, oh, what's that? Okay, got it. Okay, everybody ready? We'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and the bylaws are approved. We're in a new business. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. I had a, a, a letter delivered to me in my package, and uh, I think it's important that uh, I read this letter out and, and find out what we're doing with uh, senior citizens and, and, and bus passes. Uh, this letter is in regards to the free transit for seniors of Niagara Falls. Firstly, I wish to express how much I and many fellow seniors have appreciated this wonderful opportunity to move about the city and save a significant sum of money. 
please regard this letter as an appeal, a plea, really for this program to be extended indefinitely and not to cancel it at what might be the worst possible time of the year. Sidewalks are treacherous at, at best, even when not covered in snow uh, and are slippery. With frozen runoff can be dangerous for those that have mobility issues. The amount of money it saves me by being able to travel about the city to make medical appointments without having to pay two or three or four or five fares means a great deal to me as a senior on a fixed income. Um, I'd like to know what the status is, if, if, if we can, about the uh, free transportation. Uh, yes, of course, through you to the, from the mayor. Um, Transit will be preparing a report for January this coming year, and it'll have all the analytics and results of the pilot study that concluded on uh, November 30th. Well, perfect then. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just want to, uh, I know it's, it's Christmas uh, coming up and we're doing our, our annual uh, uh, toy drive uh, in honor of Dalton uh, Jakes. And it's been, I think it's five years now uh, since we started. And just to give you a little recap about uh, young Dalton um, back years ago, five years ago when Dalton was, uh, diagnosed with osteosarcoma, the same cancer that uh, Terry Fox uh, had back in 19, uh, 1980 when he was running. Um, uh, Dalton had it in his leg and they wanted to save his leg so they ended up at amputating the piece of uh, bone from his leg and he was doing really well and unfortunately uh, he was in remission and then unfortunately it came back and it went actually to his, uh, to his jaw and um, uh, he was doing okay and then um, Fortunately, the tumor grew and grew and grew, and um, uh, Dalton wasn't doing very well, and um, very sick at the time, and, and so we wanted to, to give Dalton a wish, and, and kept in, in, in touch with him and, uh, and his family, and went up to uh, Ronald McDonald House where he was staying, and I actually asked him, I said, what would you, what would you like for, for Christmas this year? You know, he, he wasn't doing well, and we didn't, we didn't know how much longer he had, and, uh, Dalton, in thinking he would ask for a trip or something like that, he uh, asked that if uh, um, they could bring Christmas presents uh, to to all uh, the kids at Ron McDonald House and uh, the families there, as well as uh, the brothers and sisters, because uh, unfortunately during Christmas time, um, while the children at Mac, at Mac all their families, uh, brothers, sisters, parents, are stuck at, uh, not stuck, because Ron McDonald's does an amazing job. They have 40 rooms, a chef, and do amazing things. But unfortunately, they would like to be home for Christmas and can't be. So um, we started Dalton's Wish that year, and, and we, we continued it for the last uh, four years. And uh, we've been getting unbelievable uh, um, toys and, and, and different gift cards from everybody around the area to help uh, families and their children and siblings during um, the tough times during Christmas because even though you know there's sick children at the hospital all the families at Ron McDonald's which is a great place to be but still they don't want to be there uh, during Christmas um, so we're asking uh, uh, hopefully everyone again to uh, to continue Dalton's wish because um, Dalton passed away um, after that uh, that wish that he grant that we granted him to give all the families uh, Christmas present, so we're continuing Dalton's wish. So on uh, on Monday, December 16th at Boston Pizza, um, uh, and uh, courtesy of Rob Phillips, the owner there, we're allowed to, uh, from four, so four six o'clock at Boston Pizza on Dorchester Morrison, if anyone would like to drop off unwrapped gifts or gift cards, anywhere from infant to 18 years old, um, and their parents as well, and we're going to hand deliver these on uh, December 23rd to Ronald McDonald House and keep uh, Dalton's uh, uh, wish and his legacy going because he was a special boy and I know everyone around this area, and especially Welland, uh, they continue and, and miss Dalton. And um, just found out that in the mayor's office, uh, Carrie and Sarah and Christine, Kathy and Teresa, they're continuing that same wish as they are going to be uh, at the December 19th employee Christmas Party. They're asking some employees to, to bring uh, toys and, and gifts for the same cause. So I appreciate it and uh, 
continuing uh, these gifts and to refer a very special boy who had a, a rare uh, disease and it's becoming a little bit more common now as we know and we have young Alex Louis fighting right now and, and Julianne Misk so it's a very special way that we could um, um, care about these kids not only the kids that are fighting but their um, their siblings that have to stay at Ronald McDonald House while this is while their uh, sisters and brothers are, are fighting in McMaster so I'd appreciate to just to keep this uh, Dalton's wish going on as, as much as we can so so again, the date, uh, it's Monday? Uh, Monday, December 16th at Boston Pizza. What and time? then What time? Uh, 4 to 6 at Boston Pizza um, on um, Morrison and, and Dorchester. And then we have the employee Christmas party, courtesy of uh, all the girls at the mayor's office who've been amazing. Um, that's December 19th at the Gale Center. And they will, will be hand, hand delivering these uh, gifts on December 23rd, a couple days, and, and hopefully we can uh, help uh, some of these families out and uh, even though they have a chef there you know we're even asking Boston Pizza there's a couple doors down from Ronald McDonald's just separates the families a little bit where they can go and just spend a little Christmas time by themselves and maybe have dinner at, at Boston Pizza so if anyone would like to uh, to help donate um, and if we can maybe put this on our motion put this on our website okay. um, I know fairly quickly but uh, it's next Monday December 16th so Monday, December 16th, uh, Boston Pizza, 4 till 6. Yep. Bring your unwrapped presents. We're a motion by Councillor Strange that we put it on the website and promote it through the city. Yep. Second by Councillor Cario. Uh, I'm sure there's nothing uh, nothing more to add to that. We'll call that vote. All yep. those in favor? Okay, that's I, great. I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. I'm really excited about uh, watching, um, even though it's not Michael Bolton, uh, we get to watch that. <laughs> Brian Adams, uh, Brian Adams is sure, which is going to be truly amazing. And I don't know how you got him, like seriously, in all seriousness, uh, hats off to you, Serge, for, for getting him, because it's going to be unbelievable down there. And I'm sure everyone's been talking about it, everyone's been coming down, and I know it's going to be jam-packed, and it's going to be a fun event. Look forward to, uh, to seeing the results and how many people come down there. And the weather's going to be good that night, too. Of course, just around, yeah. like... Minus one, It'll so just, just perfect. Just enough yep. to freeze the grounds, not too much. Exactly. Yeah. That's how it's going to be. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, that's great. Do we have any other new business? Yeah. Uh, Councilor Peter Angelo. Oh yeah. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I, I would, would wouldn't feel right if I didn't have something. Uh, tonight I wanted to announce the final numbers from Sleep Cheap. Uh, as oh, yeah. you know, we have our meeting coming up on yeah. Monday yeah. where um, we're going to continue with the theme of putting a significant portion of the money away to do something uh, that's impactful at the new hospital. But aside from that, Sleep Cheap raised over $133,000 this year. Wow. Um, yeah. And the Wonder Falls Pass clocked in at 14600 wow. So that'll be good to uh, that'll be good as well to make our parks more accessible. Yeah. Um, so that meeting's coming up on Monday, and again, there's going to be a lot of happy uh, agencies, you worship, that are going to be the benefit of uh, of Sleep Cheap once again. Well done. Um, I did have a question though, um, and uh, it's not really for tonight, but I just wanted to pass it through to staff. Um, I know that we have given status to a building inside the city that's that's being built right now and the status that we've given them is partial occupancy um, i've had three different people uh talk to me about this um i don't know a lot about it that's why i was simply going to pass it over to staff and maybe staff can give council some information on it um i i i think people like it's a it's a high story building i think it's 10 stories and people are allowed to move in when the bottom stories are done that's kind of the gist i get about it um, but the complaints that I'm hearing is that all the amenities aren't finished before these people have to move in. So, again, getting some information from staff would be helpful. And then uh, I, I don't know if we have policies around partial occupancy or if it's something that is in our control. Um, but it would be an interesting discussion anyway. So I pass that over and maybe at a future date uh, <coughs> staff can come back yeah. with something you worship. Okay, fair enough. I'd also like to thank staff for the wonderful job they did decorating uh, to make the chambers festive for Christmas and the holidays. And uh, I'd also like to, what's that? I'd also like to uh, wish everyone a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, Happy Holidays for everybody. Don't drink and drive. Um, make sure that you definitely plan to be at our New Year's Eve show. You're gonna wanna be there. It's gonna be one of those great ones. And uh, the other thing I wanna say too is this past year for me, feels good being back in a better place, a healthy place. And my only takeaway 
that I like to share with everyone is don't wait till you lose something to appreciate it. That's my only message because I'll tell you something, um, and I hear Councilor Strange talking about these young kids and, and what a terrible situation, but the, the lesson is, you know, life is precious, it's fragile, and um, don't wait until you lose it. And I'll give you an example. Probably nobody here is thinking about their furnace right now uh, or your car, but if the furnace breaks down or the car doesn't start, that's all you think about. And if you've got your health, you've got food in the fridge, a roof over your head, someone loves you, you're already wealthy. And I can tell you, when you're not, you don't think about anything other than those things. So the most important things you already have. So maybe take the holiday season. And all my only, my only uh, suggestion is just take time to appreciate what you have. Because every bite of food tastes good. Everything that you got in life is great. You've already got everything that you need. So on behalf of the city, I want to wish everyone a happy, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and all the best for everybody. Thank you very much. We're adjourned. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. This meeting is over, Mr. sir. Mr. Mayor.